Hey, Virginia is sponsored in part by... Everance Financial is grateful to serve this community. As a faith-rooted financial services organization, we're dedicated to helping members grow more confident futures with their values in mind, a community that's doing better together. Welcome to Hey Virginia. I'm your host, Kate Martin. And in this episode, we'll meet a community of artists who form a collective called the Pigment Sanctuary. Then we'll visit the historic and mysterious Swannanoa Palace. We'll also meet artists who create amazing pieces out of clay. Then we'll hear from a valley hip hop artist and visit the unforgettable Lou Ray Zoo. Don't go away. All this and more is coming up on this episode of Hey Virginia. Deep in the mountains of Appalachia, there is a collective of artists working to establish a healthier art scene in Virginia and surrounding states. We spent some time with two of the founding members of the Pigment Sanctuary to learn more about the movement they are helping to cultivate. My name is Ashton Hill. I'm an artist that lives in Virginia. Uh, I, with some friends, have started thinking about this thing called the Pigment Sanctuary and trying to bring it to life. Our, uh, our goal is, is to bring together a bunch of artists from anywhere, really, um, and bring them together both in this physical space but also together in a community um, that helps each other grow and collaborates generously. So, um, as the Pigment Sanctuary, we've already gone out and done multiple festivals uh, under that name, and Lacey's already done one, what was that one? Culture Fest. Lacey already did Culture Fest as the Pigment Sanctuary, we did Mountain Music Festival, we did uh, Fahrenheit Flow Art Festival as the Pigment Sanctuary, and when you create a platform for artists to come together and do whatever they want and not just hang art on the walls and sell it this way, then suddenly you create a place that people want to be in and feel comfortable hanging out in. Um, we had, at some of these galleries out last year, we had uh, people come in and start dyeing hair and uh, doing makeup and doing all of this body modification and beautifying and like, uh, clothes cutting and you know like whatever you wanted done body painting whatever it was whatever you wanted done um you could come in and do it there or find somebody to do it with you there and it was okay because it's being creative in the sanctuary of color the pigment sanctuary so that's a uh, working progress but so far so good Let's see, if you were to walk up to a pigment sanctuary at a typical festival, um, what you might see when you walk in is yoga happening in the middle of the, in the, middle of the gallery area um, with a workshop leader running that. You'll see art covering every wall. Um, you might see vendors that are selling tea or like herbal kind of uh, healing remedies. And you might see you might see a band playing late night, um, like Star Baby and the Rolling Ohms. Um, you, I don't know, we, we really want all kinds of creativity and things to be happening in this area. Um, so usually we have lounges so you can hang out and uh, make yourself feel welcome and you don't have to just walk in and walk out or walk in, buy something and leave. Like you can come and hang out. Like this is your space to hang out and be creative too. Um, we want 
all types of creativity to come and be a part of it, not just limited to being a painter or being a musician or being whatever. We want all types of creativity to be here in this hub. Hi, I'm Lacey Valandry. I'm an artist based out of Harrisonburg, Virginia. I've been drawing longer than I could ever write. As soon as I could hold a pencil, I learned how to draw Winnie the Pooh. And from there, it's just been a long journey. I grew up watching my sister paint and my mom make her cartoons. And in 2014, I really got launched into this live art movement and accepted into this wonderful family of artists that we're all just this incredibly tight-knit community and work on cultivating something that'll make us all better and make us all successful rather than this dog-eat-dog -dog mentality that often happens and is associated with being part of the art world. And we're really working to change that idea and to turn it into something that is loving. And that's something that's been really magical to me. We want to collaborate generously. We want to share our art and share experience and, and grow together and become something bigger and better and new um, with all of the elements of art, not just one, not keeping all these things separated. Like, let's, let's become one at the Pigment Sanctuary and create something new and amazing. Um, anyway, if you want to possibly collaborate with us, reach out to us. Um, we're just getting started, but it's thepigmentsanctuary at gmail.com. Um, message us. We do festivals. Sometimes we're going to start doing, <laughs> we're going to start doing retreats. Hidden away at the top of Afton Mountain, on the border of Augusta and Nelson counties, is one of Virginia's most extravagant and mysterious mansion estates. Built in 1912 by billionaire and philanthropist James Dooley, as a summer home for he and his wife, Swananoa Palace attracts visitors from all over the country. Swananoa is really amazing. It's a bygone era when it was built. Swananoa was built by the Dooleys. Their main home was in Richmond at Maymont. Swananoa was purchased by, uh, in 1911 by a farmer. And so they bought a thousand acres on top of Afton Mountain. And in 1911, they began building. And the outside is marble from Georgia, the state of Georgia and America. It was brought by railroad to the base of Afton Mountain to the train station. It was taken off the train, put on oxen carts, and the oxen pulled all this marble up. At the top of the staircase, we have a Tiffany window one of the largest installations of a Tiffany window in any house in America. And it has Mrs. Dooley and a shroud in the back of her garden. There were 300 artisans who worked inside, speaking different languages, who carved uh, and did all of the frescoes. We had uh, French, Italian, we had Middle Eastern and Asian Indian, uh, all doing this wonderful work inside. Many people ask me if they're ghosts. No, there are not ghosts. I lived here for four years, and if this villa was haunted, I would think they would have made their presence. I was here alone with no electricity in 2004 when a hurricane rolled in. It's interesting that many of the valley people really don't know anything about Swananoa. They don't know it exists. And often when they come up, they're just amazed. When you come up the drive, 
and you turn and you see this massive marble villa, it's quite overwhelming. You'll have to come see it. <laughs> Earth, Fire and Spirit Pottery has been creating beautiful works of art for many years. We spent a day with the owners in Lexington, Virginia, where they shared their history and gave us a look into what it takes to create such unique pieces of art. So I grew up in the pottery studio. My dad started really working with clay when I was about two. And um, he supported our whole family doing art festivals and traveling around um, and he was um, a, just a huge role model to me um, so I knew early on that this is what I wanted to do and I went to some college and did a few things on my own but I always came back to clay I did my first show when I was 17 and I'm 37 now, so for 20 years I've been doing working in clay and doing art festivals. Um, we moved to Lexington, Virginia in 2011 um, because I had uh, my daughter and I was driving from Oklahoma to the East Coast maybe twice a month and that's probably a 20 hour drive both ways. So we needed to be on the East Coast for our shows and that's how we ended up here in Lexington. Basically everything we make, we start out with a 25 pound block of clay, which we get all of our clay from a company in North Carolina that actually, they mine some of their local clay and process it and then mix it with some other, um, other types of clays and other minerals to have the right properties um, for working with. Uh, we make everything by hand. Uh, we don't use any slip casting molds or stuff like that. We use the potter's wheel and we have a slab roller. We roll out big slabs of clay to make some of the slab work. Once a piece is made, um, you have to keep close, you have to monitor how quickly it's drying, make sure it dries evenly. When it gets to a certain point where it's not completely dry, then we usually do the decorations. Um, all this stuff that's made on the wheel gets trimmed, the bottoms get trimmed. Um, so they're nice and then those get decorated. And once it's completely dry, uh, we put it in the, um, these electric kilns, and that's called a bisque firing. It goes up to about 1800 degrees. Um, and that's just the initial firing and it burns out all the organic material in the clay. You know, all the water gets evaporated out and hardens up the piece just enough where it can handle it without without it being so fragile. At that point, we glaze the piece, which is, you know, we dip it into a big mixture. Um, the glaze is basically different minerals and um, color, uh, oxides that um, won't, in the final fire will melt into glass to coat the piece. Um, and, that, and that final firing, it, we do out in a big gas fired kiln that was to about 2,400 degrees. It, it's almost, it's about an 18 hour process firing that kiln and then it, had, it takes a couple days for it to cool. Once it's cooled enough, we unload the kiln and either pack it up to take to a show or take it up to the gallery. Now we do art festivals and we also um, open this gallery to try and come off of the road a little bit because we do have young children. And the gallery actually started as a much smaller space than this. It was about 800 square feet. We were a block down the road. Um, now we are a little over 2,000 square feet and we represent over 60 artists. And it has evolved into something that I never thought it was going to be. And it's been a really fun journey. Um, just being able to work with artists that work in different mediums and um, allow them to have a space to show their work as well as us has been a dream of mine and I hope that I can also um, continue to do that while raising my family and just being able to live life. Our Virginia Sound Showcase features Harrisonburg native Lee Andes. 
aka Rob Boss with the Afro, who has been performing hip hop long before the genre became popular. Now, he's taking his love for music to the next level with his new project, Rappers on the Edge. Take a look. My name is Lee Andes, aka Crimson Music, aka Rob Boss with the Afro. Um, so when I was a child, uh, my dad has been playing bluegrass music all my life. Um, so I, from probably five till I was 12, I was just on the road and probably before that, it's just, I don't remember, but I was just on the road with my dad almost every weekend to different festivals and whatnot. And I never really got interested in it myself other than playing a couple of chords on the guitar and the mandolin. But, um, but when I first got a love for music myself, it was for hip hop. So when I was first starting to do uh, shows and stuff in public in Harrisonburg, it was 2009, 2010, I think. And, and there was zero hip hop scene that we call it now. There was no opportunities for rappers exclusively or, uh, or even in a multi-genre setting at all. Um, the open mics and stuff that I went to were acoustic nights at Dave's Taverna and poetry nights at the Little Grill and open mics at Taylor Down Under on campus. Um, but there was nothing specifically for hip hop. And um, I didn't have this much hair back then, but I still didn't look like a rapper either. Um, and so no one really knew what to do with me. And it was very uncomfortable. It was a, a lot of um, fear to overcome and nerves to overcome to be able to do shows like that where it's mostly middle age and older people or college age and, and younger but neither, none of them are expecting me or necessarily wanting to hear hip hop in those environments at that time. Um, so that was, a, that was a challenge for sure. And um, I moved down to South Carolina with my best friend, Luke. Um, when, when I was down there, I got more involved in a scene that was actually available. You know, They actually have a lot of hip hop acts down there and a, a very rich history in the culture. Um, so I kind of got my stage legs really underneath me down in South Carolina. Uh, I feel like I've been able to see the scene grow night and day as opposed to what, where I left it from, you know. Um, when I got back up here, of course, Grayling Sky is kind of running everything um, through his influence, which has been awesome because he literally saw a crack in that armor of like no hip hop through the hard metal uh, community and the house show community. So he kind of like split it open for everyone. Yeah, um, Rappers on the Edge is, uh, is my way of paying homage to uh, Jerry Seinfeld. What up everybody, it's Rob Boss with the Afro. You are now watching Rappers on the Edge, and today we have a very special guest, Keynote Illage. Um, it's, a, it's an idea that me and my best friend Luke came up with while we were watching uh, Comedians in Cars Getting Coffee. It's a, it's a genius show and we love it because we, we appreciate and love these comedians for their bits and their sets and their, their uh, Netflix specials, but we don't know hardly anything about them. And Jerry was able to take these 15 minute episodes with no premise other than just having a conversation with these people that we already look up to and respect. And so we wanted to do that and I have a GoPro and like a car mount for it and it had like a cool ring to it, wrappers on the edge, I drive a Ford Edge. Um, 
And so all we're going to be talking about is the stuff that drives us as creatives, you know, whether it's the meaning behind lyrics or what went into making an album or who inspires you, you know, all of these things push us rappers on the edge. With the ever-growing influence of computer technology on our day-to-day -day lives, cybersecurity is an issue that has moved to the forefront of modern security. We wanted to hear what you had to say in the matter of security in cyberspace and the impact it has on your life. How you doing guys? Alex Anthony here with WVPT at James Madison University. Today's segment is on iPhones and cybersecurity. Let's find out how much these kids really know. Are you aware that your iPhone tracks uh, where and for how long you've been places? No, I didn't. You aren't aware of that? Yeah? Is that the thing where you can like look up what addresses you visit the most? No, I was not aware of that. Yeah, that's scary. I do not have an iPhone. No? Yeah. Interview's over. Cut. So say something happened to you tomorrow, would you want the contents of your phone deleted? Look at that grin. <laughs> not really, man. I got nothing to hide, so. No. Nothing to hide? I don't, not really, no. <laughs> uh, no, not, nope. You're a better man than I am. I, not particularly. There's nothing incriminating on there. <laughs> Even if your parents saw it? Probably wouldn't want my parents to see it. Mm -hmm. but. I don't know if my flirting, you know, should be for everybody. My texting. So you got game. I, some. I'm gonna have to actually take the contents of his phone, because I need game. Yeah, they might find some weird stuff. Okay. Well, this for me. Well, no need for a bike anymore. <laughs> the Lou Ray Zoo in Page County is known to some tourists and world travelers, and even some locals, as a hidden gem, though it's very accessible from Highway 211 in Page County. Let's take an in-depth look at this zoo to learn more about their amazing animals, including a macaw that loves her blanket, and perhaps the star of the show, a Bengal tiger. All right, get up in the morning, get the animal food prepared, uh, take it out to the different animals that get fed in the morning, clean out their enclosure, it's a routine, and you got to keep it the same every day. If you change it any little bit, they don't like it. When I bought the zoo, it was the Luray Reptile Center. And I recognized right away this place has monkeys, has a petting zoo, it has birds. Why name it Luray Reptile Center? And so I changed the name to Luray Zoo in 1998, so people would feel that this, this is not a place with a bunch of snakes, it's something else. So that changed the dynamics completely. A lot of people came in here and said, I never came into this place because it was the Reptile Center. I never knew you had a petting zoo. I never knew you had all these different animals. People that come from New Zealand uh, every year to visit the zoo. Uh, people that come from England, from France. Because once they come here, they, they really love this place. It's a little, small, quaint zoo that a lot of people fall in love with. And people that come here from around the world usually will tell their friends, you gotta check this little place out. Kiki. Kitty, kitty, kitty. Well, this is Star Bengal Tiger. She just turned 14 years old this year. Her birthday's July 4th. And she was brought here in April of 2004 as an eight month old. All right, over here we have Jojo and Jordan. Jojo's been with us since 2004. She was born here in March of 04. And just past March, on March 13th, she had this little boy, named him Jordan. And the Capuchins are one of the smartest of the monkeys. They are uh, very intelligent so they can be trained to uh, even be service animals. Uh, some people do have service monkeys. It's unfortunate a lot of people think that zoos are bad. Uh, no, they're a resource for animals to 
educate people about their existence. But in the future, uh, things might be tough for zoological parks. And being a small one, it's tough there too because a lot of the small zoos are not as popular as the bigger zoos because a lot of people think, oh, it's just a roadside zoo, uh, you know, probably animals all sick. And, uh, uh, unfortunately, that's a lot of stuff that people say. But when they come here, a lot of people say, this is amazing. change their minds and maybe make think, people think that this is a good thing having animals so they can educate the public about the plight of the lemurs in the wild, the plight of the Andean condor in the wild, since they saw one and think, wow, maybe we should do something to try to preserve them. Well, that brings us to the close of another show. Thanks for watching. I'm Kate Martin, and we'll see you next time right here on Hey Virginia. Hey Virginia is sponsored in part by Everance Financial is grateful to serve this community. As a faith-rooted financial services organization, we're dedicated to helping members grow more confident futures with their values in mind, a community that's doing better together. I'm coming home. There's a place where I can come Where the food is wrong And the people are so warm Hey